Mike Bryan again with another installment of Muhammad and the History of Islam. In our first segment, we had posed the question, how did a guy living in a remote corner of the largely pagan Arabian Peninsula come to view himself as the prophet of the Judeo-Christian God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? How did he even know about uh, the Jewish uh, Christian God? Well, as we saw, there was plenty of opportunity to have contact with Christians. We saw that Mecca was the home of the Kaaba, and among the pagan idols found in the Kaaba was, in fact, at least one Christian icon. And that in the nearby uh, community of Medina, which was at that time called Yathrib, we're going to talk about that, but in Yathrib slash Medina, there were a uh, group of Jewish people living there. So Muhammad from the earliest times had exposure to Christianity and Judaism. More importantly, as we saw, the Arabs viewed themselves as descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. Ishmael being Abraham's first son uh, through the slave girl Hagar. Okay, So we saw that the Arabs viewed themselves as descendants of Abraham. There was contact with Christians and Jews uh, in a multiple, a multitude of ways. And as we saw last week, in fact, there was a violent confrontation with Christians when the Aksumite Empire from Ethiopia made an attempt to conquer uh, Muhammad's hometown of Mecca in the year of his birth, 570 AD. They had come with war elephants, and for that reason, the year of Muhammad's birth, 570 AD, was called the year of the elephant. They didn't succeed, but we're now going to turn to Muhammad's early life because he was born in that same year. Muhammad was born into a pretty prominent family in Mecca, one of the the four major clans in Mecca, and his uh, father and then his uncle was the leader of this clan. Muhammad was orphaned at an early age and was initially raised by his grandfather, and then when his grandfather died, uh, he was raised by his uncle, who was a traitor. So Muhammad, as a child, would accompany his uncle on his uncle's trading trips throughout the Middle East, and as we're going to see, even beyond the Middle East. On one of these trips to Syria, which is to the north of Arabia, there's a legend that Muhammad and his uncle encountered a Christian monk who foresaw Muhammad's future as a prophet. And as the story goes, he claimed to see stigmata forming on Muhammad's skin. He saw shadows around Muhammad that indicated his, his future greatness, and uh, written in the clouds was the prophecy of Muhammad's greatness. He further claimed that he had seen the original unedited version of the Gospels that uh, only you and, that you and I have seen. Um, he saw the unedited versions, which had spoke of a future prophet uh, that would replace Christ. And he, this monk claimed that he recognized Muhammad as the prophet promised in those unedited version, versions of the Christian Gospels. On these travels, Muhammad and his uncle traveled far and wide. They would go to the Mediterranean, as we've seen up in Syria, but they also went as far east as India. So Muhammad got an exposure to a lot of different religions, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Hinduism, uh, Zoroastrianism in Iran, uh, had a very highly developed worldview of spirituality. And his thanks to his uncle, he and his work as a trader, Muhammad gained a reputation for honesty and wisdom. One example of this was uh, when, when the Kaaba got uh, damaged, as we, we discussed in our first class, sometimes happened, um, and the tribes were fighting over who would get the honor of 
placing the black stone in place. It was Muhammad who came up with the solution. He basically had the four main tribes of Mecca each take hold of a single corner of a sheet and then ask them to nominate somebody to put the black stone in the middle so that collectively the four tribes could all carry the black stone back to its place at the cornerstone of the Kaaba. Well, they were so impressed by this uh, display of wisdom, this, this solution to the problem, that they nominated Muhammad to be the one to place the black stone on the sheet, and then all four tribes were able to carry it back to its place and rebuild the Kaaba. By age 26, his reputation was such that uh, he was able to marry a wealthy widow in uh, Mecca named Khadijah, okay? And it was at this point in his life when Muhammad became a very spiritual man and he would retreat for weeks at a time when he was back in Mecca into the countryside, into the mountains to pray and meditate. And it was 14 years later at age 40 when he finally got his first revelation. The angel Gabriel came to him while he was meditating and told him that you are God's messenger. Well, Muhammad was very troubled by this. He felt himself completely unworthy uh, to be God's messenger, to, to receive any kind of prophecy. And he actually contemplated suicide, but Gabriel told him, no, you cannot commit suicide. You have a mission here on earth. After that first revelation, there was another three-year hiatus before the second revelation came. And Muhammad spent that time uh, meditating again, praying uh, as he had always done. And when the revelations resumed again at age 43, that's when we start to see nascent Islam being revealed to him. Okay? The first principle of Islam is that there is no God but Allah. Okay? Another key principle that, that Muhammad discovers in his prophecy is that paradise is going to be the reward for a virtuous life, and by contrast, the tortures of hell is the alternative for an unvirtuous life. Other key facets of this early form of Islam, the righteous man will pray and seek forgiveness. Uh, the righteous man will demonstrate honesty chastity and charity, and above all, uh, the religion forbids the killing of inf infant girls. The collection of prophecies that Muhammad articulates, he didn't actually write them down, they were transcribed by his followers, um, but the collection of these prophecies that Muhammad is speaking is called the Quran. So before too long, Muhammad is able to gain actual adherence, believers that he is this prophet that he claims to be. And the first of his uh, adherence was none other than his wife, Khadijah. She has the honor in Islam of being the first believer. The first male believer was Muhammad's 10-year-old nephew, a kid named Ali, okay? And Muhammad's first adult male believer was a guy named Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr and Ali are going to be two very important players in our story. They're going to be the founders, respectively, of Sunni and Shia uh, forms of Islam. We're going to talk, hopefully, if we have time, about the split between uh, the Sunni and Shia and the rivalry between Ali and Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was an important follower to gain. He was another wealthy merchant there in Mecca, um, an early key financial supporter of Islam and, and a protector of Muhammad when things got hairy. The other earliest converts to Islam tended to be people from the lower uh, social strata, the lower economic strata, poorer people, um, similar to the earliest adherents to Christianity in that regard. Um, but Muhammad is gradually gaining adherence from all over the Arabian Peninsula. Remember, he's perfectly situated to speak to not just local people, but 
indeed people from all over the place, because of his location there in Mecca, home of the Kaaba, home of the Hajj, where once a year people from all over Arabia descend on Mecca, and at that time Muhammad can be found preaching the prophecies that he has received from the angel Gabriel and convincing people of their authenticity. Now remember that the first principle of Islam, the first principle of what Muhammad is preaching, is that there is no God but Allah. And this is where his preaching is going to start to cause problems uh, among the listeners and particularly among his fellow citizens of Mecca, right? Because basically he's saying there is no God but Allah. All these other icons and idols that are in the Kaaba are fake and not, you know, shouldn't be venerated. And that's not welcome to many of the people who are there making a pilgrimage to visit those very same idols. Okay, so he becomes unpopular among many of his listeners. It also irritates the, the residents of Mecca because they feel like he is uh, threatening their economic livelihood, right? Remember that the Meccan fair is the whole sustenance of the community of Mecca. They don't have agriculture. They don't have anything else going for them there in Mecca. That's their year is, is this Meccan fair. So if, if Muhammad challenges this idea of these pagan idols, what's going to happen to the Kaaba? What would happen to the Meccan fair if Muhammad's new religion takes place and we no longer, for example, have the Hajj? Okay, so because of this, some of Muhammad's followers are actually killed um, for following him. Muhammad himself manages to escape uh, this, this fate because he's a member of a very powerful clan there in Mecca, one of the four powerful clans or tribes that makes up the city, and his clan protects him, right? Anybody who would do harm to Muhammad would suffer the same fate Muhammad's relatives would be would be bloodbound to exact vengeance on them so that's how people are kept safe in this is through the protection of their clan right but if Muhammad were ever to lose the protection of that clan then he would be in very grave danger right some of his followers who don't have the protection of a powerful clan like Muhammad does end up fleeing and actually taking refuge in Abyssinia, another name for the Aksumite Empire over in Ethiopia. Now it's about this time in the early days of Islam when Muhammad was under a lot of pressure from the fellow citizens of Mecca that he received uh, some debatable prophecies. Um, that turned out to be considered to be the temptation of Satan rather than true prophecies. But for a while, he was articulating them as part of the Quran. They're the so-called satanic verses, also known as the bird verses or the story of the cranes. I've never really understood why, because they really have to do with the three daughters of Allah. Remember we talked about this in, in the first uh, section of this class, how some people who viewed Allah as not the sole God, but instead as the supreme God, articulated this belief that Allah actually had three daughters, three divine goddesses for daughters. Well, this belief made its way into the Quran for a short period. Finally, the angel Gabriel convinced Muhammad that what he had heard was not true prophecy and convinced him to retract it from the uh, from the Quran. But you probably remember, gosh, 30 years ago, there was a, a writer named Salman Rushdie who wrote a novel called The Satanic Verses. And it was a historical novel about Muhammad and about this flirtation with the idea that, that God wasn't monotheistic, but indeed had these, these goddess daughters, and it caused a huge outrage in the Islamic world. There were death threats against Salman Rushdie, and he had to go into to hiding um, under the protection of the British government, in fact, and uh, was under hiding, in hiding, and under British protection for many, many years. 
So as Muhammad keeps preaching and it continues to, to stir up alarm among the Meccans, finally the other three clans of Mecca allied themselves against Muhammad's clan and they boycott Muhammad's clan. They're not going to do business with them. They're not going to socially interact with them. It's really becoming a tense situation for Muhammad's family members. Fortunately for Muhammad, his uncle is the leader of the clan and he steadfastly supports Muhammad. And again, that keeps Muhammad safe keeps the clan together, although they're really starting to feel the pressure from their fellow citizens there in Mecca. Things change in the year 619, which in Islamic lore is called the Year of Sorrows, because not only does uh, Muhammad's uncle die, but also his wife Khadijah dies. So Muhammad loses two of his most important supporters. Remember, Khadijah was the first adherent to his new religion. The leadership of the clan passes from Muhammad's uncle to another relative who is an opponent of Islam. So now things are looking really dicey for Muhammad. Remember that the way the clan structure works, if Muhammad loses the protection of his clan, then people can kill him without impunity, right? So he's really facing a dire situation. And before it comes to that, Muhammad actually starts casting about Arabia, trying to find some place that will give him sanctuary. And he's not having any luck because he's ticked off people all over the peninsula with his attack on the pagan traditional polytheistic religions that they adhere to and the icons that they've been worshiping there inside the Kaaba. One of the ways that Muhammad tries to protect himself is by making new marriage alliances. So he marries, makes a couple of marriages. Uh, yes, he is a uh, polygamist, okay, and that was very common among uh, men of Arabia at that time. Um, not unusual for, for Muhammad to do this, okay. The first woman he marries is a widow named Sawada and tries to gain the support of her family. But more importantly, he marries a young girl named Aisha. Actually, she's six years old when they get married. They don't have sexual relations or anything like that. Um, but it is a betrothal, right, that unites him to her father, Abu Bakr. And in fact, Abu Bakr, we've already talked about him. Remember, he was the first adult male supporter of Muhammad, the first adherent to Islam, that is, the first adult male adherent to Islam. And the interesting thing about Abu Bakr is, even though he has this outsized role in the early history of Islam, being the first adult male adherent to the religion, we don't actually know his real name. Abu Bakr literally means father of the virgin. And this is because his daughter, Aisha, is destined to become Muhammad's favorite wife. And she's actually going to eclipse her father in importance to such an extent that he's simply known as father of the virgin, this, this wife of Muhammad. It's also during this period of stress that Muhammad has a very important uh, prophecy called the night journey. This happens in the year 620, so one year after the death of his uncle and his wife Khadijah. In this night journey, Muhammad is transported to uh, what he calls the farthest mosque. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is Arabic for farthest mosque. That is to Jerusalem where he's told this is, you know, the, a home of the new religion of Islam. And he's transported there on a winged horse named Barak. Now, I know what you're wondering, and I haven't been able to find any connection between this winged horse named Barak and our former president named Barak, okay? Um, same sound, different spelling. It may, in fact, be phonetically the same name, but no necessary connection, okay? Also on this night journey, he experiences what is called the mirage, where he gets to tour heaven and hell, and he meets with the prophets, 
Abraham, Moses, and importantly, Jesus. Okay? The Muslims recognize Jesus as a prophet of the Judeo-Christian God, just not the Messiah and not the final prophet, not the most important prophet. That role is reserved for Muhammad. So Muhammad is able to kind of hold on to his position there in Mecca very uncomfortably for a couple more years. But in 622, a situation finally presents itself that offers him the opportunity to get out of Mecca, get out of harm's way once and for all. And it has to do with what's going on in the town of Yathrib. Okay, Yathrib, you'll remember, is eventually going to be have its name changed to Medina, but at this time it's a it's a village called Yathrib to the north of Mecca. And the situation in Yathrib is that they've got eight clans in that city and they're feuding with one another. Five of these clans are Arab, three of the clans are Jewish, and there's kind of a shifting set of alliances where they're fighting amongst each other and in recent years, it has actually come to blows. There was a battle called Buath in 617 where they literally took up arms against one another. So the citizens of Yathrib are looking for a mediator, somebody who can help solve their problems and figure out a way for them all to live together peacefully. And of course, a great uh, candidate for this role would be Muhammad if he hadn't ticked so many people off with his preaching. So what Muhammad has done is he has converted some citizens of Yathrib, and a dozen of them have not revealed themselves to their fellow uh, citizens of Yathrib as Muslims. They take it upon themselves to kind of lobby on Muhammad's behalf, arguing for his talents as a mediator and a man of, of wisdom and honor and honesty um, that could come in and help solve the situation in Yathrib. But of course, they're hoping that he will come in and prove to be the Messiah of the Judeo-Christian God. Once he's gotten the invitation from the, the Yathribis to come and be their, their savior, if you will, uh, Muhammad instructs all of his followers to leave Mecca. And he stays behind with only two followers, right? And the two followers are his nephew Ali and his closest adherent and protector, Abu Bakr, okay? When the Meccan authorities realize that all these Muslims have decamped from their city to go to their, their arch rival, Yathrib, remember Yathrib had those Jewish uh, tribes who had poo-pooed the idea that there's any connection between the Kaaba and the Ishmaelites, or the story of Abraham and Ishmael in the Bible, right? So there's this bad blood between Mecca and Yathrib, or Mecca and Medina, uh, another name for Yathrib, that now the idea that Muhammad, this troublemaker, is going to go and set up shop in Yathrib is really galling to the Meccans. And they decide they're going to make, pay a night visit to Muhammad and solve the problem of Muhammad once and for all. Well, Muhammad catches wind of this plot before they're able to kill him. And so what he does is he's got his two followers there, Ali and Abu Bakr. He gets Ali to dress up wearing Muhammad's cloak. And Ali stays behind in Muhammad's tent. He's going to be the decoy. Meanwhile, Muhammad and Abu Bakr sneak out of town at night and they leave uh, the village through a little-known route. Now remember, Muhammad has traveled all over the Arabian Peninsula. He knows every back road that there is in and out of uh, in and out of Mecca, and so he's able to find a route that's little known and throws his pursuers off the trail. Right, and they're traveling under the cover of night. So Muhammad and Abu Bakr, who has 
come down in uh, Islamic legend as the sole companion for being the guy who accompanied Muhammad on his flight to Yathrib. Uh, Muhammad and Abu Bakr reach a mountaintop cave where they hide out for a couple days while his pursuers are on his trail. Okay, And there are a number of legends that have grown up around this period where they're hiding in this mountaintop cave and how it was that they were able to escape detection of this giant posse that's, that's chasing them down. Uh, one tradition was that a spider, you know, built a big web that covered up the opening to the cave so that the pursuers couldn't see into it. Another was that the wind blew branches from the nearby trees, bent them down so that they covered up the opening to the to the cave. A third uh, tradition was that, you know, there was a pursuer who was just about to stumble into the cave and find them when a flock of pigeons suddenly flew off you know, 30 yards away and distracted his attention and, and got him off the scent. So for whatever reason, they were able to hide out and avoid detection. Uh, one of Abu Bakr's uh, servants knew where they were and he brought them goat's milk to keep them alive until the pursuers finally gave up the chase, figuring that Muhammad was long gone. This flight from Mecca to Medina is called the Hijra, okay? It occurs in July of 622 AD by our calendar, but for Muslims, the Hijra is year zero. It's the equivalent of the birth of Christ is for us, okay? They date everything going forward from this event in Muhammad's life. So whereas we have Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, they have Anno Hejira, in the year of the Hejira. All right, so this flight from Mecca to Yathrib is a pivotal, seminal event in the history of Islam, okay? And because of that, the people associated with this event have kind of a special status in Islamic lore. Remember those guys that were in Mecca that Muhammad had sent to kind of pave the way to leave the city of Mecca uh, ahead of him? Those followers of his who had stuck by him in Mecca and then went and set up shop in Yathrib for him are called the Prophet's Companions. And remember that there was that group in Yathrib, the dozen guys who had kind of convinced the city leaders of Yathrib to invite Muhammad to come and be their peacemaker, those guys, that group of 12, are called the prophet's helpers. All right. So we have kind of reached an important stage in the development of Islam, this flight from Mecca to Yathrib. And what happens next is an important chapter in the development of the religion, making it a much broader based religion than what it had been hitherto. So in our next section, we'll talk about Muhammad and what he does with his religion in the city of Medina.